A friend of mine became a monk and took on the name Shindo, traveling around the Sanyo and Sanin areas. He stopped by an old large house in a certain village in Tajima province and asked if he may partake of lunch with them. The head of the family, around 40 or 50 years old, presented him with some food and he ate while inspecting the condition of the houses around them. The rows of storehouses and sheds were horribly rotten, the eaves falling down, and numerous walls entirely collapsed. And for a rather large house, he saw no one other than the owner around. Finding it strange, the monk asked about it after he was done with his lunch. According to the owner, it all started about three or four years earlier. At that time, the house had been prosperous with numerous servants and many large fields of rice. A snake lived near the pond where the women washed rice and it came out to eat the grains they left behind. Over time, they started to feed it the leftovers and, gradually, it lost its fear of humans. Later, it grew so brave that it followed the women back and entered the house. It took up residence under the floor and ate the food given to it. They even named it like a pet cat, and it came to understand when it was being called. However, as the years went on, the snake grew bigger and bigger. People passing by the house outside began to fear it as it poked its head out of the floor. People from the village soon stopped visiting entirely, and so, one day, the head of the house reluctantly spoke to the snake. As long as you're in this house, people are too afraid to visit. That's no good for us at all. Please, you must go back to the mountains. I'll take you there tomorrow myself. That night, he crafted a large basket, and the next morning, he returned to the snake. All right, get in. The snake slid over and obediently got into the basket. It coiled itself up and several people carried the basket up into the mountains, roughly a few miles away. Here is fine. You can stay here. They put the basket down, snake and all, and returned to the house. The next day, the owner was worried about how the snake was doing, so he decided to take him some food. The snake was in the same spot. He hadn't moved. Every time the owner returned to visit, the snake was in the same general area. But some time later, he noticed the snake had dug a hole beside a nearby waterfall and was living there instead. Over time, the snake widened the hole, but this in turn muddied the drinking water the farmers downstream used. This was a big problem. The farmers sought help to chase the snake away, but the owner was unsure of what to do and, so, did nothing. The farmers, losing their livelihoods, filed a complaint with the local government. A government official came out and had the owner guide him to the snake's location, and then immediately killed the snake. Disasters soon struck the farmers one by one. Some went blind, while others died. The snake must have cursed them, of that they had no doubt. They collected the snake's ashes and enshrined them to Benzaiten, performing a ritual to comfort the snake's spirit in the afterlife. Yet, this had no effect, and one after another, the farmers continued to die and lose their fortunes. At present, the owner was the only one left with his large house intact. The small shrine to Benzaiten is still in the pond out back. You can go and see it for yourself, the owner said. The monk did as he was told, and the garden was so large that it indeed appeared to be that of a powerfully wealthy family. There was a magnificent mound in the middle of the pond, and on this island was a small shrine. I don't know whether the snake cursed us or not, the owner continued. It's difficult to guess, but it's natural that we would be reduced to all of this. And, as part of my repentance, I have now told you everything. In the southern mountains of Awa, there had once been sightings of a mountain witch. This was when the witch was no doubt still young. 
One night, a lumberjack was boiling tea in his cabin when the witch arrived. She had undoubtedly changed form, but she appeared to the man in the form of a beautiful young woman with white skin, long black hair, and she stood before him stark naked. He smiled and led her inside to the fire. Would you like some tea? he asked. His desire for the beautiful woman outweighed his fear, so he poured her some tea and she calmly drank it while they spoke. When dawn came, it was time for the witch to leave, but she left with some parting words for the man. I'll come see you again soon for some more tea. She appeared to be holding something back, but then left. In the mountains to the north, a hunter waded deep in the mountains for a boar to pass by the trail. As night fell, he gathered dry wood for a fire, and a woman appeared. She approached the fire. Please let me sit by your fire, she said. I wish to blacken my teeth. Go ahead, the hunter replied, looking her over. She was a beautiful woman with white skin and long black hair. The woman painted her teeth black and then spoke again. If I am chased by a deer here, would you kill it for me? No problem, he replied. And soon a deer came running. He killed the deer, and the woman tore the deer apart, biting into its raw flesh. The hunter trembled. She'll probably come for me next, he thought. And while the woman was eating the deer, he loaded his gun with another bullet and lit the fuse. When the woman was almost done eating the deer, she turned to approach the man. Well, I have one more favour to ask of you. But the man fired, and the woman escaped, as though disappearing into thin air. The hunter grew so afraid that he left the mountain at once. This is how terrifying mountain witches truly are. A monk friend of mine told me a story about a thatched hut down the Oi River in Totomi province. Every year, five to ten people were discovered drowned from floods in the Oi River basin, and the number of people who died while trying to cross the river was unusually large. People pulled the bones up every time they floated by, and they held a funeral for them at the thatched hut. They didn't know who the people were, or where they came from, so they buried them in the dry riverbed without a grave tablet, and marked them with their personal belongings, such as a cane or a hat. It was most pitiful. Every autumn, on prolonged rainy nights or in the moonlight, they could hear the voices of the departed crying out. They were the spirits of the drowned. The voices were so heartbreaking that they gripped people's hearts. Ceaselessly they cried, from upriver and downriver, all night long. As this continued night after night, the nearby villagers gathered, bringing with them zeni to hold service to soothe the suffering souls. After that, the voices of the departed ceased, and if they did not hold a Buddhist ceremony for the deceased, then each summer the plains would flood and the village's rice fields would be destroyed. On his way to survey Ezo, the explorer Mogami Tokunai made his way to Nishidi Island by boat. Upon seeing the beautiful sight of the mountain rising above the clouds, he was overjoyed. We have arrived near Ezo and encountered a splendidly high mountain. We should be able to see the opposing shore and lands of the Kitan from the top. We will be able to see the crossroads of the topography and the land and sea for the first time. Well, let's get going. Hearing this, the locals rushed to stop him. Those who climb the mountain are known to engage the wrath of the mountain spirit and meet unfortunate ends. You mustn't climb it. But Tokunai roused himself. It will be okay. Why should I fear a thing such as a mountain spirit? And so, Tokunai's party set off, 
but as they were about to climb from the foot of the mountain that day, a fog set in. Unable to see even an inch ahead of themselves, the party was forced to return. The next day was a fine sunny day, so they started to climb once more. But, as they reached the mountainside, once again they were enveloped in fog and forced to go back. The day after that was even finer weather than before. Today we will do it. Let's go. Halfway up the mountain, they were again halted by fog and forced to stop. It suddenly started to rain, and on top of that, the men were forced to endure a horrid stench that lingered in the air. But they refused to give up, and so they continued. Finally, at the bottom of a rock face, they saw the carcass of a giant turtle. As they got closer to it, the smell became more intense, and there was not a single man who did not lose his lunch as it assaulted their mouths and noses. Having reached this point, even Tokunai gave up, and the men retraced their steps back down the mountain. In retrospect, all of the catastrophes that were caused by angering the mountain spirit were undoubtedly because of that dead turtle. <laughs>